Welcome to the Great War Discussion Group. We are uh, right at four o'clock and it's time to get started. Uh, I think there may be a few people signing in uh, as we move along, but we're up to about 20 people and that's enough to get started. <clears throat> Mike Burke is our speaker for this afternoon and he will be talking about something that we don't hear as much about in the museum, but it's a very important part of the war, namely the war uh, on the Italian front, largely between the Austro-Hungarians and the Italians, but also dragging in the uh, British, the Germans, and in fact, even the Americans. So without further ado, Mike is well known to all of you. Mike, it's your it's your podium. All right. Well, thank you, Charlie. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm sure that uh, this photograph may be familiar to, to you, either from personal travel or the movies or picture books. And I um, mean, if you haven't never had an opportunity to go travel to the Alps, I strongly recommend that you do so if you get the opportunity. And again, this is a beautiful pastoral scene. But imagine, if you will, having the fight in the same Alps during the winter time with the extreme weather conditions that I will describe uh, a little bit as we go on. And it's for this reason, it's for the altitudes, for the weather, that this war is often called the White War or World War I in the Alps, and which I will be talking about today. Got a lot of photographs. I may not talk to all of them, but there are a couple that I do want to point out. And so. One on the left is an Austro-Hungarian soldier guarding up in the uh, on the Dolomite Mountains, guarding the mountain pass. Right, so I thought that was rather interesting with the with the uh, you know the uh, the clouds below him. And on the right, those are Italian Alpini making their way up to their battle positions from down in the valley. Um, on the western portion of the Italian front, the the these mountains range from 2,000 to 3,000 meters or approximately 6,500 to almost 10,000 feet. Uh, they're going to be fight at the at these higher altitudes. And so it, another name that these uh, battles or, the, or this war is often called is a war within a war. Because first, the soldiers had to fight, had to battle the, the altitude, they had to battle the weather conditions before they could get themselves into a position where they could attack their opponents. So this is what I propose to go through today. And let us start with an overview. So in a truth in advertising, uh, when I first volunteered for this subject, I mistakenly thought that 100% of the battle in the Italian front took place in the mountains. And upon further research and review, I, I found that I was mistaken. Um, there is really only one major battle that takes place uh, in the Alps, and that's Asiago in 1916. But that said, there'll be constant maneuvering and battles and fighting between combatants all along the 400 mile front that stretches from Switzerland all the way to the Austro-Hungarian border. And so uh, the first portion of my presentation is really gonna talk about some of the battles and the conditions in the Alps. And then I'm gonna divert just a little bit to uh, let's talk about the battles that occur in the northeastern portion of uh, Italy on the Azzazzo River Valley. Um, the border, as you see here, was established in 1866, right after the uh, the Prussian Austrian, uh, the Second War of German Unification, the, the war against between Prussia and uh, and Austria. And um, I didn't realize that the Italians actually sided with the Prussians during the for this 1866 war, and it, in return for promise of extended territory. Uh, they made two futile attacks against the Austrians uh, to capture Trieste. But um, regardless, this is the boundary that exists. It's almost over 400 miles. So it's almost the same length as the, the trench system in the, uh, the Western Front. I mentioned major battle will be Asiago. That's really still in the mountains. Again, already talked about the Italians could spend the bulk of their time in the Zazzo River Valley. And fighting here in the Alps will, will basically revolve around the Dolomites, this area here and this area in Trento. Trento is what the Italians proposed to capture, but they never really make any attacks there. And it's 
here in Trento to Asiago and here in the Dolomites towards Caporetto that the, the Italians, or correction, the Austro-Hungarians will make, uh, will make their two, uh, two major attacks. This is an incredibly brutal war. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the compact or the uh, conduct or the makeup of the Italian army, but uh, detailed in many different stories about how as the Italians shouted Savoy and left their trenches, they were mowed down by uh, Austro-Hungarian machine gunners and artillery. Uh, numerous occasions where Austro-Hungarian officers pleaded with the Italian second and third line not to get out of the troop, not to get out of the trenches, uh, because they were going to end up being killed and they having to climb over the body of the first of the first wave as they came up. Uh, by the end of the war, Italians were going to essentially have over one million casualties, about six hundred thousand dead, and Austro-Hungary will have about one point. 2 million dead, about a third of these will occur on the Italian front. And then for those who are interested in armies, the, the three major armies involved in this particular, uh, the battles along this will be the uh, the Italian, the, the fourth Italian army uh, commanded by General Cordona, uh, the combined division from Pestrel, which is an also Hungarian unit. And then eventually uh, later in the war, when the Germans provide military assistance, it'll be a, bear, a bearish Alpine Corps that will come to assist the Austro-Hungarians. All right, I'd like to have a little history, so we'll talk a little bit about history. So um, I refer back to uh, Dr. Faulkner, who delivered a, a presentation at the museum, I think in September, where he talked about the uh, the Austro-Hungarian uh, army, the, the set its organization, government, its setup, and what it did during the war. So uh, for further information, I, I uh, direct you to his excellent presentation. But Again, uh, Prussia defeats Austria in the Second War of German Unification, as I mentioned. Uh, Austria no longer has the lead in the Germanic lead, League, sorry. And so they they kind of agreed to a, a they agreed to a compromise where uh, Austria hung, Austria Austria sorry will, will join with Hungary and they'll form the dual monarchy, which will exa exist until the end of the war. Now, as you'll see, they are two capitals. You have both Vienna, obviously, and Budapest. You've got the three official languages, and then you've got 14 separate states that are involved in this particular uh, country or nation. And so Dr. Faulkner really talked a lot about how um, it was not uncommon for an Austrian officer or Hungarian officer to command a battalion or a regiment or, or larger whose soldiers did not speak either Hungarian or German. Uh, and so, and that becomes much of a bigger problem later on in the war as more as the more professional uh, officers are killed early on in the war, and the uh, less professional or uh, less prepared officers have to take command of the military forces. Um, he did a really good job talking about the three separate armies. So you've got the Imperial and Royal Army, the KUK, which was the lesser of the three armies. Uh, you have the Austrian Army or the Landwehr. Uh, obviously, Austria spent all of its time equipping and training soldiers involved in the landwehr and the Hungarian the Hungarian government took care of the Hanved, which was its royal Hungarian army. And so it's kind of the KUK, which will be predominantly fighting in the Italian front, are really going to end up getting um, probably the lesser, the, the least best equipment of the least best trained officers. Go a little bit more about Italy. Um, one of the things I'd forgotten, I guess, because I really never paid attention to it, my bad, is that, you know, we know that Germany doesn't become a state until after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, 1871. Italy doesn't become the kingdom of Italy until uh, Rome is taken, uh, control of Rome is taken over by the uh, by the Italian government and that the kingdom of Italy is established in 1871. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, from... The Napoleonic era, all the way through to the beginning of the First World War, the Italian government, the Italian leaders, the Italian people are driven by this goal, reunification, or it's called uh, Italian Italia Irdentia, or um, the unredeemed Italy. It's all of that territory that has been occupied by people other than Italians. So it's the Austro all that territory in the east occupied by the Austro-Hungarians. Places in the north that are occupied by the by the by the French at one point in time, and so that is really what drives uh, the Italian governments uh, as they move forward 
into the 20th century was this idea that they were going to go ahead and uh, recreate the grandeur of Rome, the, the Roman Empire from the earlier times. Uh, by the time that, says, as the slide says here, once the Italian kingdom of Italy is, uh, is established in 1871, uh, the government will start finding uses for their army. And like the Austrian-Hungarian, the KUK army, where you had uh, maybe an, an Austrian officer commanding soldiers from Serbia, uh, the Italian army is also broken down by its the major, the major leaders of the Italian army all come from the north. And then they speak a different kind of Italian than the soldiers who come from the south. And so it was not uncommon for Italian officers not to be able to understand and vice versa what their soldiers were saying to them. And this, again, becomes a problem later on in the war is the more senior or more experienced officers uh, are killed or wounded out. Um, again, once the kingdom is established, uh, the, mil the government decides they want to go ahead and commit uh, the military in order to gain more territory. So you've got those two attacks that I mentioned during the, uh, the, uh, the Prussian-Austrian War. You've got the two attempts, for, though they actually occupy Eritrea without, without too many battles. Um, they are soundly defeated by the Ethiopians, first in 1887 and later in 1896. I believe it's the battle in 1887. It is the worst whipping that a European army will take from an African military in the history of the world, essentially. The, the Ethiopians are going to, you know, kick them out of Ethiopia. So they're essentially going to go to war with the Ottoman Turkish Empire over territory in North Africa, though the Ottoman Turkish Empire actually will not, the, not send troops to do that. And then based on, uh, based on the fact that the Ottoman Turkish Empire refuses to fight, they're going to go ahead and occupy uh, Libya. And they're going to fight an insurgency in Libya all the way up through the beginning of the, the First World War in 1914. Um, military leaders were not really happy about that insurgent war because it was siphoning off resources, uh, really wasn't helping them prepare for the next war. And then the other, thing, the other thing I need to mention is that while this is going on and the, the army is committed to Ethiopia, the army is committed to Libya, uh, the bulk of the military budget is going to be uh, spent on building fortification, fortifications all in the Alps uh, in the mistaken belief that uh, these fortifications will allow, uh, will keep the Austro-Hungarians from attacking into Italy. Uh, so when Italy starts the war, they're going to have almost, their ports are going to be outdated. They'll have very little railroad lines, and most of their roads are not going to be uh, suitable or capable of handling the um the, the flow of uh, soldiers and resupply that are going to go into, uh, uh, you know, from the ports up into the mountains. Uh, one of the books I was reading essentially really criticized the government. It talks about, and I, I'll go ahead and read it here just to make sure that I don't miss anything. But Italian soldiers will be the worst paid, the least trained, ill-equipped, and poorly led army in the war. They will be sacrificed to a doctrine of frontal assault, ineptly supported by artillery. No other army routinely punished entire units by decimation, which is, is stashed in the murder of one in 10 soldiers for cowardice, executing randomly selected soldiers. Only the Italian government will treat its captured soldiers as cowards or defectors, blocking the delivery of food and clothing from home. Over 100,000 Italian POWs out of an estimated 600,000 will die of starvation in captivity. Statistically, it was more dangerous for an Italian soldier to be taken prisoner than it was to stay alive on the on the front lines. And so you really got a feel for the Italian soldier, not only at the beginning of the war, but throughout the entire con uh, this entire conflict. So Italy, again, uh, kind of quickly go through this. Everybody, understands, everybody remembers that Italy is a signatory to the Triple Alliance in 1882. Um, and as war begins to, as the war in Europe begins in the, in the, the lead up to war in the 1914, the Italians essentially say, look, we're going to support our agreement with the Triple Alliance if Austria-Hungary will, will give up its territory uh, on the Adriatic. And of course, the Austro-Hungarian government says, no, we're not going to do that. And the German government will essentially say, come on, give them a break, give them, you know, throw them a bone, give them a couple of, of uh, uh, you know, pieces of terrain. But the Austro-Hungarians uh, are steadfast and they refuse to do that. So the the English, understanding what's going on with the Italians, they begin to go ahead and reach out to the Italians. So the, the Italian government is going to go ahead and essentially play one side against the other, waiting for who's going to make the best offer. And then once that best offer is made, 
they're going to go ahead and uh, to, to sign on. And so as it says here in the 26th of April, essentially, uh, the Austro-Hungarians have come back and said, no, we refuse to give you any territory. The, uh, the English say, well, not only will we give you money, and I think it's upwards of 50 million pounds, but we promise to give you all of the land along the Adriatic. We'll give you Germany's colonies in, uh, in Africa and you know, just come in on our side and go ahead and support us. And so they enter into the secret agreement. And uh, on one day, essentially, the, the prime minister and the foreign minister are involved in all those discussions. Uh, there's even a story where the, um, the, uh, the prime minister essentially tells General Cardona, oh, on the 1st of May, he says, oh, by the way, uh, we're going to war on the 23rd. Can you get your army ready in 22 days? And General Cardona replies, no, not only that, but I need another, almost another year before I can go ahead and get ready. And then General, the prime minister says, well, you better get to it. We're going to start on the 23rd, whether you're ready or not. And so on the 26th or on the 3rd of May, uh, Italy goes ahead and declares war on Austria-Hungary. But interestingly, it does not declare war on Germany. As the slide says, it won't be until 20, uh, 1916. Uh, that uh, once the Germans begin to provide military support to the Austro-Hungarians, that the Italians will declare war on Germany. Uh, just another, I got next a couple of slides just kind of showing you the terrain in the West, excuse me. <clears throat> and so it's Switzerland up at the upper left-hand corner, all the way down to the bottom. And then this kind of peters out before you get to the, uh, the Azazo River Valley. But uh, you can see that there are, there are lines, formal, you know, reinforced cities, but they're formal lines that the Austrians occupy, and there's formal, line, formal lines that the, the Italians will occupy. Um, kind of like this one, because it really kind of gives you an idea, I think a better idea of what the, the elevation change between the coast, like here in Vincenza, or Venice, sorry, all the way up into, into the mountains. Um, the Italian government uh, specifically wanted the Italian army to attack, and so uh, General Cardona, and, you know, directs his division, division commanders to, to prepare for an attack, and they start moving forward. Um, it's going to take them almost an additional month. They're really not going to be prepared to go until uh, later in June when they first begin uh, moving out of their encampments. And then not only are they going to be, you know, this will take time to muster the forces and get ready, but the Austro-Hungarians have been spreading rumors that the roads have been mined and that the buildings have been mined and there's snipers behind every tree. And so the Italian army, as it advances northward into the Azazo River Valley, is going to move incredibly slow, slowly. And uh, actually, there's the story if the Austro-Hungarians, I mean, correction, if the Italians had pushed forward by two days, they could have captured almost all of the territory that they're going to spend the next three years fighting for because the Austro-Hungarian army had been committed to Serbia and had been committed to battling Russia, but the forces here in the Alps and the forces in the Zasso River Valley were under strength, undermanned, and quite frankly, not in a position to go ahead and hold off the uh, hold off the uh, the Italians. But the Italians move too slow, and consequently, they're going to miss their shot, and they're not going to be able to defeat the Itali defeat the uh, Austro-Hungarian forces. Um, a little bit more about the conditions fighting in the Alps. So temperatures. Essentially, it remains below freezing for about four months of the year. And snow is constant from November until March. Uh, some of the winter lows recorded is, is my, you know, anywhere from minus 20 degrees to minus 30 degrees. And so incredibly, incredibly cold. Um, snowfall. Snowfall varies, but snow depth can get up to 35 feet. Uh, during the second half of December of 1915, more than 16 feet of snow falls in a short period of time up in the mountains alone. Um, something else that I hadn't thought about, but when you think about snow, in addition to thinking about skiing, you also think about avalanches. And so about 100,000, sorry, about 10,000 Austrian and Italian soldiers will be killed by avalanches. Uh, the worst occurring on the 13th of December in 1916, when an avalanche wipes out an Austrian uh, barracks and over 200 people, all 200 Austrian soldiers are killed. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's some discussion about more soldiers will die of avalanches than will be poisoned 
by gas on the Western Front if you don't count the Russians, right? So about 100,000 people will die of gas, uh, gas attacks during the war, but more, more than 50%, almost 60% of those are Russians. And so that remaining, you know, 40% of that, of that figure uh, are, are, you know, are going to be gassed on the Italian, are, are going to be gassed on the rest on the Western Front. So essentially, again, more people will be killed by avalanches, something that I really hadn't thought about. And then these winter storms, which are accompanied by high winds gusting in excess of 50 miles an hour for days on straight, again, are just going to make this theater of war an incredibly difficult place to um, place to fight in. And not only is it a difficult place to fight in, but it's also going to be a difficult place for resupply. So for the Italians, uh, if their supplies are coming into Venice, they've got to get those supplies up to the mountains, right? And as I mentioned, you know, most of the money was built or spent on fortifications, less on rail and road networks. And so they're going to have to build a series of roads. And so this is obviously a picture of a modern Italian road going up into the Alps. Kind of nice. It's got nice turns. It's got turnoffs, cutoffs down here where, where people can rest. And so this is kind of what the what the Italians are going to have to do during the war in order to go ahead and take care of its military forces. And so the next couple of slides are going to talk about our photographs. will talk about that. So picture on the left is an Italian artillery piece that's being moved up into the mountains. Um, I like the guy on the left. He's climbing down the the wooden structure. He's ensuring that the that the bottom of this roadway is not going to give out for the next gun crew that kind of passes along. Uh, the photograph on the right is uh, Italian forces resupplying in the Asiago Valley area. And you can see that they've cut those roads with a lot of cutbacks to be able to get their, uh, uh, get their vehicles, horses, or motor vehicles safely up into the mountains. Um, when it becomes too steep for, uh, for motor vehicles or for, um, or for animals, they're going to go ahead and use hoists. And so that's Italians lifting up one of their guns on a hoist up the mountain. Or they're just going to go strap in a, a, a machine gun or an artillery piece on the back of a mule and can have that mule carry that, uh, carry that piece of equipment up into the mountains. And then when it gets too steep for animals or hoists, the soldiers themselves are going to carry the pieces up into the mountains. So that's... Uh, an Italian soldier carrying a small artillery piece on his back up into the Alps. And that's an Alpini soldier carrying a heavy machine gun climbing up into, into the mountains. Again, you know, the, the ability to resupply their forces, getting it from the coast all the way up in the mountains, is going to take a tremendous amount of effort. And then once you have all those weapon systems up there, you have to supply them. And so these three photographs essentially, uh, technically the one on the left are just... Austro-Hungarian forces uh, practicing climbing, but the upper right is the Alpini unit carrying everything that it owns on its back up into the mountains hand over hand. And then the bottom right is also Italian soldiers that are carrying the lumber necessary to build their fortifications, carrying it up on their shoulders as they get uh, up into, into the mountains. Um, so along with all of this, I do want to talk a little bit about Mining. Oh, sorry. Last photograph of people being miserable in the snow. Kind of get you ready for a winter as it's coming along, right? But there's a fair amount of tunneling that's going to go along uh, in support of this war as well. Um, again, uh, in an effort to move supplies laterally across the battlefield, both sides are going to end up uh, digging tunnels, not only in the rock, such as the photograph on the left. These are Austro-Hungarian soldiers digging a tunnel or uh, the Austro-Hungarians on the right who've dug their tunnel through the, through the ice. And so a lot of tunnels are going to be built. Um, they will also extensively use mining, uh, similar to what occurs on the Western Front. Almost every battle that occurs in the Alps will be preceded by some sort of mining effort. And uh, uh, generally speaking, mostly done by the Italians, but occasionally limited also by the, uh, by the uh, or also limited conducted by the Austro-Hungarians. Um, and then well, the article that I was reading said that many of these tunnels that you see in the uh, dug into the rock exist today. And there's part of the, the road network as you drive from uh, Austria down into Italy or vice versa. So these tunnels still exist even today. So that is really the last little bit that I've got to talk to about specifically about the Alpine War. Um, again, I wish it was more, but really not a whole lot happened there.
So I'm going to transition right now into kind of talking about uh, the slaughter that's going to occur on the northeastern portion of um, Italy. So it, the Isazzo front, Isazzo is the river that runs through this valley, if you can see my mouse. Uh, the goal of the Italian uh, military or the Italian government is to capture Trieste over here in the within the yellow circle. Uh, Trieste is, uh, believe it or not, Trieste is Austria-Hungary's major port. It is their biggest port that they have. It sits on the Adriatic. Uh, it also is uh, the source of uh, numerous ground lines of communication. So you can get on a road, travel up to Vienna. You get on a road, travel into Serbia. You can get on a road, travel all the way over to the Black Sea. So again, <laughs> sorry, uh, the Italian government is going to go ahead and want to capture Trieste, cut the line of communications into Austria-Hungary, and begin to occupy the territory along this portion of the Adriatic Sea. And that is the goal at which they're going to actually conduct 12 separate battles um, against the Austro-Hungarians in just this area alone, between 1915 and 1918. All right, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about each battle. I am going to talk a little bit about the guy, on the, the gentleman on the right. That is General Cardona. General Cardona is the uh, chief of staff of the Italian army. He is the son of the Italian chief of staff who commanded the Italian army, disastrously, some may say, during uh, its support of Prussia again in 1866. Um, on his father's knee, he learned the phrase of the clenched fist that never, never, never split your forces, something that his father had done when he attempted to attack and take Trieste. And so Cardona is going to be a, kind of a two dimensional military thinker. thinker. Um, he's really not their first choice to be chief of staff of the army. Uh, the first choice essentially passes from a heart attack. And so they kind of look around and say, well, General Cardona is kind of a safe guy. Let's go ahead and give him the, the command. Um, his major claim to fame is that in 1888, he's going to write an article for the Italian military magazine that essentially it's called um, Frontal Attack and Tactics Training, which becomes the, the guide, just like the, the spirit of a land or the spirit of the bayonet, the offensive doctrine for the French and the offensive doctrine for the English. The Italian's entire doctrine is going to be uh, based on a frontal attack. And he's the first guy who's going to start talking about a war of attrition. His goal is to attack frontally, either with or without artillery, with or without machine guns. The, the spirit of the Italian soldier will carry the day, and we will decimate or we will def defeat our opponents by just murdering all of them that we get. Um, now, granted, now that's I'm, I'm kind of a little cynical about General Cardona, but again, he does inherit a really bad situation with regards to the military. Uh, understaffed, undermanned, underpaid, uh, committed to an insurgency war in Libya, uh, almost no direction with regards to the way that money is spent. Uh, the army itself is incredibly top heavy. Uh, it describes, you know, with, with general, it has a bureaucracy, like almost everything has a bureaucracy nowadays. Um, half of the army is illiterate. They don't understand anything Italian. They don't speak Italian. They don't read Italian. They can't understand Italian. So they're going to have a challenge. It's a uh, incredibly top-heavy, a lot of doctors, a lot of veteran, uh, veterinarians, sorry, and um, a whole bunch of bureaucrats who have to approve every decision before it becomes enacted. And so he is going to have a bit of a problem. Um, as I mentioned, the, the prime minister said he had 25 days to prepare. It's going to essentially take him about 50 before he gets his army ready to go. And uh, he, he is going to have to... Uh, battle the bureaucracy in order to get the resources necessary for him to be able to uh, to conduct the offensive operations that he wants to conduct uh, throughout the war. Uh, fortunately for General Cardona, he had the full support of the king. Um, I didn't mention it, but the king is extremely weak. He wanted to be anything but the king. And so Cardona had his ear. Uh, both the prime minister and the foreign minister had his ear. And whatever those three gentlemen asked for, uh, the king would go ahead and rubber stamp it and override the decision of parliament. Um, the other thing, the other kind of a quasi negative thing about General Cardona was he never took the blame for anything that went wrong. Um, he surrounded himself with yes men. They were not allowed to talk about anything that went bad. Any report that came up from a division commander that was critical of the of the high command was censored. Um, if you spoke out against General Cardona or his leadership, you were 
either retired or you were put off into another front. Um, he actually had ministers fired. He would go to the king and say, this minister is preaching sedition or he's talking bad about me or talking bad about the army. I want him relieved. And so that happens quite a bit. And so you have a, a headquarters that refuses to hear anything negative, uh, censors anything that may be considered negative, and you know, punishes anybody for anyone for using their initiative. So that's one of the reasons why they're going to end up conducting 12 battles on the Itzatso River Valley. Um, it's noted by 1917, when he's relieved, he will have fired 217 generals, 255 colonels, and 355 battalion commanders, all because they failed to do what he expected them to do, uh, regardless of whether they had the resource to do that. And so, again, he's not necessarily the smartest guy, brightest tool, bulb in the pack, but he's what the Italians have got. So that's what they're going to end up doing. Um, I got a figure in here. These four battles in the Zetzel River Valley in 1915 are going to end up with over 130,000 Italians dead and triple that number wounded. So they're going to gain no territory whatsoever in these four battles. Kind of like these photographs, the one on the left, I mean, the bicycle troops as they are bicycling in there or they're preparing the bicycle on their way up to, uh, up to the front. And then these are uh, Alpine, Alpine soldiers as they're walking, making their way up towards the first battle of the Izazzo River Valley. Uh, 1916. So potentially 19, uh, 1915 doesn't turn out too good for the, uh, the Italians. Um, once the weather uh, becomes more suitable for an attack, they launch their, uh, their fifth battle of the Izazzo River Valley. Uh, tremendous number of casualties. They make almost no territorial gains. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian chief of staff, um, whose name I will build up in a minute, uh, Conrad van Holtzendorf, uh, will finally be able to uh, pull together enough forces, and he wants to go ahead and to attack. And so on the uh, on May 1916, they're going to launch what is called the Punitive Expedition. Um, some 2,000 Austro-Hungarian artillery batteries are going to launch a, bar a barrage against the Italian lines. Uh, they actually sent Tarantino a fire, and they're going to attack along a 50-kilometer front. The Italians, uh, despite the intelligence that the Austro-Hungarians were massing forces on their front, uh, failed to reinforce it, and so they will uh, retreat, and they will continue to retreat uh, <clears throat> so that the Austro-Hungarians occupy the Asiago Plateau and, and will continue to actually uh, want to move forward to attack down into Venice or into Vicenza or any of those uh, coming out of the mountains. But unfortunately, also Hungarians, as in many times in combat, are going to run out of resources. And so uh, with the sixth battle of Zatso, uh, the Italians will push the Austro Hungarians back to almost their original starting line. But again, that won't stop the Cardona, and he's going to go ahead and essentially conduct four more attacks into uh, the Zatso River Valley. Uh, the most successful one was the sixth battle of the Zatso, uh, that one that was there from 16 to 17 August, because it seizes, the Italians were able to seize a city called uh, Gorica, which is uh, just north of uh, Trieste, and it controls two of the major roads that lead out of Austria down into Trieste or out of Trieste up into Austria. So they're actually going to make some gains in the sixth battle of the Zatso. Uh, but they're going to go ahead and squander more forces uh, in the remaining three battles of uh, 1916. Um, another key event that occurs, oh, sorry, a photograph. These are Italian soldiers on the, during the Battle of Asiago and on the right, and on the left, uh, the Italian forces uh, after, the, after that battle, or it, th that winter as they're getting into the winter of 1916. Uh, additionally, uh, we all know Emperor Franz Joseph passes on the 21st of November of 1916. Um, he was the longest running emperor, the longest reigning emperor, emperor of any time and seventh longest reigning ruler in history. I mean, he he ruled Austria, initially just Austria, then later Austria-Hungary. Um, he was the guy who kind of made all the decisions. He, um, But he was, his passing was, I don't think the Austria-Hungarians were really prepared for that. And so his Grand nephew, great nephew, uh, Charles I becomes emperor on the 30th of December of 1916. Um, 
interestingly enough, he, you know, he really never expected to be emperor. I mean, the uh, Franz Joseph's son committed suicide. Uh, Ferdinand is assassinated in Sarajevo. And so they're kind of working their way down uh, the family lines until, until they find Charles. Um, and uh, he actually, as soon as he becomes emperor, he begins a secret communication with the French seeking uh, an armistice or at the end of the conflict. Uh, his brother-in-law is a member of the uh, Spanish royal family, but he's a Belgian officer. So he reaches out to his Belgian brother-in-law and essentially says, hey, look, can we start negotiations? I'd like to get Austria-Hungary Hungary out of the war. But um, neither of those, that, neither the Belgians or the Allies overall want to engage him. And so consequently, uh, it goes for not. And he ends up, he said, remaining the... Uh, the emperor until the end in 18, or I'm sorry, in November of 1918. Uh, we get into uh, 1917, essentially. Uh, the Italians, once again, once things dry up, the Italians are going to go ahead and attack. Uh, they're going to try the 10th, the 10th and the 11th battles of the Zazzo. Um They're going to go about, they're going to get about 15 miles worth of territory at the cost of about um, 160,000 casualties, 36,000 dead. And so essentially, they're going to not, not really not going to gain much of anything. Um, the uh, General Conrad decides that maybe there's an opportunity for him to go ahead and uh, conduct another major offensive. Uh, he asks the Germans for assistance, but the Germans, quite frankly, are not really ready to, uh, to provide a lot of assistance. They do provide some troops. And so he scrapes, Conrad scrapes together enough forces. And on the 24th of October, he, they attack at Caporetto. Um, and this is probably the, at least, you know, before I started doing any research on this, if you asked me anything about the Italian front, uh, the Battle of Caporetta was probably the only thing that I am familiar with. Uh, essentially through uh, Hemingway's book, uh, which is later turned into a movie, we see that. But um, but on the morning of the 24th at 0200, the, Ital the Austro-Hungarians are going to launch a uh, an artillery and a gas attack. Again, the Italians kind of knew that it was coming, but they failed to prepare. Uh, they actually had no plan for withdrawal. They had no idea what they were going to do in the event of an overwhelming attack. And so the, um, the essentially the Austro Hungarians essentially rout the entire second army. And those that aren't killed uh, during this initial portion of the battle, many of them will retreat back into Italy. Uh, a lot of them, excuse me, a lot of them are going to go ahead and surrender, become prisoners of war. And so consequently, it's going to be the really the, the most disastrous battle that occurs for the Italian government throughout the war. Um, the, uh, they're going to continue to retreat. They're going to make their way back to the, uh, the, the Piav. I'm probably misspeaking it, but the, the river. They're going to get across the river before the Austro-Hungarians can reach there. Uh, the Austro-Hungarians, once again, are going to run out of resources. And consequently... Uh, the, the battle of this attack in Caporetto will stall. Uh, the Italians will then use the 12th Battle of the Azazzo to push the Austro-Hungarians back into uh, the lines where they began. Uh, the Italian government is so shaken that they realize they can no longer keep General Cardona. And so there's a new prime minister, there's an entire new Italian government. Uh, they convinced the king to allow them to sack Cardona. And so on the 17th of November, he's replaced by General Diaz. Um, the Allies are so so concerned about what's happening in Italy and the Battle of Caporetto that um, on the 30th of October, so while the battle is still being fought, a General Foch will travel from France to the Azzasso River Valley in an effort to, in, to talk to General Cardona to get an understanding of what's going on. He will be followed by a, a British general named uh, Robinson, who's also looking at what the heck is going on. Uh, you know, are the Italians going to be defeated uh, will this be the end of the Italian support for the Allied effort? Uh, as a result of the visit of Foch and Robertson, uh, the first French troops will actually show up on the 7th of November. Uh, British artillery batteries had already been there supporting the Italians, but it, Br British soldiers will be there by the end of November. And then, as Charlie mentioned in, my, in this introduction, the Americans will also send a uh, division so that uh, the Italian government, the Italian military are going to be backed up by uh, with by Italian forces. And then uh, 
Germany also realizes that it's going to provide, it's going to need support, so they're going to provide additional forces to uh, to the Austro-Hungarian as well. Um, kind of end at the at the, we end 1917 with the uh, resupply forces coming for the Italian and reassessment of re realignment of resources for the Austro-Hungarians. Nothing really happens much until uh, the spring of 18. I'll pause briefly, kind of talk our way through this one. Upper right are Italian soldiers attending mass, so religious services take place out throughout the war, right? Uh, the bottom, the next three photographs are essentially medical related. So you got the, you got the the dogs carrying the medical supplies, helping the aid men treat the Italian soldiers. Uh, you got some Austro-Hungarian prisoners carrying down an Italian wounded through the snow on the bottom left, and then the Italians actually rigged up pulley systems where they could lower their wounded down the, uh, from the upper levels down into the valleys below so that they could go ahead and uh, and receive medical care 1918 again you know we've uh, you know you've got the major german you got the german offensive of night of march of 1918 uh general conrad is sacked he's replaced the austro-hungarian chief of staff conrad is replaced is sacked he's replaced by uh, uh general arthur arts van strassenberg uh, who essentially thinks he can muster enough forces to uh, to defeat the Italians, and so he's going to uh, start building up his forces in an effort to to launch an attack. Unfortunately, some Austro-Hungarian soldiers desert, and so desert, and so they go over to the Italians and they tell the they tell the Italians, "Hey, a major battle is going to be prepared, is, will be conducted. Here's the date of it." So actually, uh, three hours before the Austro-Hungarians begin their offensive bombardment. Uh, the Italians attack. And General Diaz fires uh, all of his guns and actually breaks up a battle, uh, breaks up a, uh, a first wave uh, of the Austro-Hungarian army. Um, good news, they broke that part up. Bad news is the attack was on about a 30-mile front, so the, 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 uh, the soldiers on either side of that portion of the battlefield will continue their attack. Um, uh, fortunately for the Italians, they're going to be able to withheld that, withhold that attack or withstand that attack and then they're going to go back into the offensive, as you see here, the Battle of the Pav River. And finally, with the, with assistance from the uh, the Allies, they're going to go ahead and, and conduct the final battle, which is Vittorio Benito, which is, uh, as you see there, on the 20th, uh, October to, um, to November. Um, essentially, the, this final battle is what knocks the Austro-Hungarians out of the war. Uh, the attack is so successful that they're going to lose essentially 90,000 men in the attack by the Allies, uh, they're going to lose several general, 224 general officers, 5,000 cannons, 400,000 machine guns, and uh, about 40, 4, 448,000 Austro-Hungarian soldiers going to be captured. It's at this point on the 29th of October that um, the Austro-Hungarians asked the Italians uh, for an armistice, which they agree to. And an armistice is entered into force on 4 November in 1918. Uh, actually, in a small villa outside of Padua, if you ever get a chance to see that. And so we find ourselves at the end of the war on the Italian front. And by 4 November, things are over. So how, do, how does the war affect Austria-Hungary and Italy? So let's, let's see, take a look, right? So essentially, <clears throat> by the time the armistice is designed, the people of the of Austria-Hungary, all of those 14 separate states are tired of the war. Um, they want their independence, but they listen to the, the words of English leaders. They listen to, as it says here, President Woodrow Wilson, who talks about Aust uh, the, uh, re uh, disassembling the dual monarchy, and they want their independence. And so there's going to be not really civil unrest so much as a lot of civil disobedience, right, within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so uh, Emperor Charles I is going to try to do what he can in order to, uh, to hold on to what he's got. He's going to make concessions to the people. He's going to offer them up more freedoms, more independence. But essentially, by the 11th of November, he, um, he's essentially sidelined. And they actually pass a law outlawing the uh, Habsburg uh, monarchy. Uh, they, they refuse to allow him to hold any office. Uh, they want him and the royal family to leave Austria. They just want him out. And so by March of 1919, Charles I abdicates, and he's trundled off to 
someplace where I don't, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Uh, this kind of enters into, a, a so 1919, 19, 19 into the mid thirties, enters into a period of, uh, of problems for the Austro-Hungarian, what used to be the Austro-Hungarian empire. Uh, they're gonna be racked by uh, a lot of coups and counter coups, protests, uh, got the Great Depression, they're gonna be unable to feed themselves. Uh, governments are going to rise. Governments are going to fall. Uh, people are going to want to go ahead and develop their own independence. Uh, essentially, all of those 14 states uh, become their own uh, separate governments afterwards. Uh, and so it's going to be very confusing or very difficult for them until about 1938, when um, uh, there, were, there had been repeated efforts for Austria to join with, with Germany. Uh, but they had they hadn't been passed in Parliament, and the people didn't really want to support it. But eventually, uh, on third, on the, the Austrian government agrees to hold a plebiscite on 13 March, and on the on on 12 March, the day before, the German army marches into Austria and announces a uh, reunification. So by 15 March on 1938, uh, Austria is then uh, included now in the Greater Germany. And that's a picture of Hitler addressing the Austrians uh, in the Heldenplatz uh, in April of 1938. And we all know what happens to Austria-Hungary during, or Austria during the Second World War. So what happens to the Italians? Well, to be honest with you, they got screwed, if you pardon my French. Uh, <laughs> the Allies reneged on every one of the promises that they made them. They didn't give them the 50 million pounds. They didn't give them Turias. They didn't give them any of the Adriatic. And they didn't give them any of the German colonies, essentially. And so they were kind of, they were kind of passed over. Uh, essentially, you've got like 1.6 million military deaths, and there's 500,000 civilian deaths because a lot of uh, Italians are going to die of starvation. Uh, their national debt, as it says here, just goes through the roof, more than 300%. Economic disruption and shortages, uh, when you compile that with the, uh, the Great Depression, they're going to have an inflation that is uh, up over 400%. And so the Italian people um, are going to have some, some serious issues. Um, I didn't talk about it initially, but, uh, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there, but that, that bullet that you see there, uh, and I think it's one of the things that you see in Italy today with regards to how it's governed, but you've got so many different parties, political parties. You've got you know, the Christian parties, you've got the nationalists, you've got the socialists, the fascists, the industrialists. I mean, it's really, really difficult for any one person or any one party to go ahead and gain control. But eventually that will occur, and that kind of occurs here when Mussolini uh, becomes prime minister in October of 1922. Uh, he was initially a fascist. He wrote uh, against the First World War uh, because of the, you know, the workers' revolt. The workers were going to get together and end the war. But eventually he sees the benefit of, fight, of, of, of war, and he becomes an ex-socialist and becomes a fascist. And he will serve, sorry, he will also serve in the Italian army. Um, he's elected prime minister because he promises to end the strikes. He promises to make the railroads run on time, if you remember that. And he uh, essentially is uh, elected prime minister. Um, there's a, I think there's an assassination attempt or two. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's riots, the railroad strikes. Um, he's almost overthrown by the people. But he uses his uh, black shirts, his fascists, uh, essentially to to murder, to intimidate, to beat back any sort of um, any sort of criticism. And by 1927, uh, he controls the entire government. And then, in, as we know, everything kind of goes downhill from there. So that, I think, wraps up my outcomes for Austria-Hungary and Italy. Uh, before I get to my conclusion, I want to go ahead and ask a couple of questions. I'm not looking for answers, but if you know, raise your hand. No, just kidding. Um, anybody recognize this logo? <laughs> right. So that's Ferrari, right? Everyone knows that's Ferrari. Everyone wishes they had one, but none of us have the money for it. So where did uh, where did Ferrari get that logo from? Well, essentially, it was from this gentleman. This is Francesco Barcarlo. Barcar well, I'm not going to try. I can't. Place. He was Ita Italy's leading ace, uh, and he had 38 aerial victories. And he always had a horse symbol on every one of his aircraft. And you see the similarities between uh, the symbol on Bacarl's airplane, uh, aircraft and uh, uh, Ferrari's. Uh, essentially, it says here, Bacarl's, 
mother presented his prancing stallion emblem to Enzo Ferrari when he established the company in 1939. Uh, the horse was painted on the fuselage of the fighter plane, a heroic airman of the First World War. And so essentially, uh, Ferrari is going to go ahead and, uh, and honor the sacrifice of this individual. All right, next question. Anybody recognize this dashing young German officer? And that is Erwin Rommel, Johannes Erwin Eugen Rommel. He is uh, he will he will fight on the Italian front. He's going to he's with the Royal Württemberg Mountain Battalion and uh, uh, an Alpencore Soldaten. He's going to fight during the Battle of Caporetto. Uh, there's actually a quote from him talking about uh, the number of Italian prisoners that his unit captures during that battle. And he will also fight during the Battle of Monte Costa, uh, which occurs between Hungary and Romania. So Rommel will get uh, we'll learn a lot of what, and he actually, in his book, Attacks, he talks, I think he's got two chapters on what he learned from his time on the Italian front. And then the uh, last question for this evening, anybody recognize this dashing young 18-year-old? And yes, it is Ernest Hemingway, who as an 18-year-old is a volunteer ambulance driver in Italy. Um, he will be wounded, and I kind of capture that in the uh, Farewell to Arms. He has more than 200 artillery fragments in his body uh, as a result of an attack in July of 1918. Um, he receives the Civil Medal of Valor from the Italian government for his bravery and was one of the first Americans to be honored in this way. And so Ernest, even Ernest is going to go ahead and be involved in the Italian front. All right, so where do we find any artifacts? In the museum, essentially kind of, in addition to, there's a lot of entries on the timeline, but essentially it's this one glass case there in the, in the Eastern core. And you've got, the, you know, you've got the Italian helmet and the list of bands tunic, and you got the snowshoes that you point out to all the kids because they never see it when they're going through on the scavenger hunt. And there's an, an Alpini soldier's uh, helmet there. Uh, on the back wall, there's a map of the German Alliance. So essentially up here is the German Alliance. Interesting enough, has Italy in it. <laughs> uh, they actually had to change that, obviously. And then you've got this cartoon in the back, which is called um, La Ronda. And it, it's essentially the Allies are urging Italy to join them to cut up the uh, the uh, the Triple Alliance, to cut up Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the other Turkish Empire. So, uh, in addition to these, plus the plus the uh, the entries on the um, on the timeline. Uh, that's what we've got for the Italian front, plus the uh, up up in the up in the exhibit hall where we've got the uh, Austro-Hungarian discussion as well. So that's where you kind of go to to find out um, a little bit more about our, our artifacts from the Italian front. So what can I say in conclusion? Essentially, the bottom line is nothing. Nothing ever turns out the way people want it to, and I would say that nothing really turned out the way that the Italians wanted to. Um, they went into the war for the wrong reasons. Uh, they got out of the war for the right reasons. Uh, essentially, however, it sets them up for uh, the tragedies that occur in 1930 and 1940. And so um, what we have here is the upper left. That's an Austrian cemetery. It's about uh, 10 miles located uh, west of Wien. Uh, below them, below that is a gate dedicated to all of the Austro-Hungarian soldiers who perished in the war. And that is in the Heldenplatz in Wien. Uh, up here in the upper right, that's the ossuary at Asiago, where um, let me think, over 50,000 Italian and Austro-Hungarian uh, soldiers, are their bones are interred. I uh, actually had a chance to tour that. Uh, got stuck in Italy for a month. Oh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Uh, had an opportunity to go ahead and go to Asiago. And then bottom right, that's the tomb of the unknown soldier in Rome, uh, which commemorates Italian sacrifices uh, throughout the war. So essentially, wrap, kind of wrap it up, Italy is going to have about 689,000 dead, um, another 1 million wounded, and about 600,000 prisoners missing in action. The Austro-Hungarians are going to have about 4.8 million casualties, 1.2 mil million are dead, with about one-third of all of that occurring on the Italian front. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, the incomplete or the impartial or the, the end of the First World War is going to set Austria and Italy up for what occurs to them uh, in the result of the Second World War. 
And one last thought before I turn it over is, you know, we talk about, you know, 100 years after the end of the war, we're still finding relics uh, in, in the Alps as the, you know, global warming or the glaciers recede. Uh, that one on the left, those are two Austrian soldiers. Uh, they were in the Prasina Glacier in 2013. Uh, the lantern in the upper right was in an Italian dugout that was first found um, in 2015, but they had to wait several years before the ice melt melted before they could go and get in and start bringing out the artifacts. And then this Italian cannon was buried completely by ice, and that was uh, it's, it's at the 3,000 3, meter uh, Almadeo range, and that was found in about 2015 as well. And so as the Again, even though the war's over, even though things have ended, we're still seeing uh, relics of the Italian front as the ice melts. Um, these are some of my references. Uh, my predominant one was the White War, which is on the next page. Uh, but that's some of them. And those are some of the other ones. And with that, I will pause, get a drink of water, and ask if there are any questions. Well, Mike, uh, I, I think it was on one of your maps, but one of the big things that the Italians wanted was Trieste, which they claimed was inhabited by something like 40% of the population was actually ethnic Italian. So who finally got Trieste? Trieste stays with with Austria, with Italy. Fiume oh, okay. becomes part of Yugoslavia. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. I have, while we are at it, I have a couple of comments to make. Uh, Charles and his family, he had quite a large family. His wife was a uh, Sita of Bourbon Parma, and through her, his brother in law, as you mentioned, came the famous Sixtus letter, which wanted a separate peace uh, with the Allies and Austria Hungary. He ends up in Madeira. Uh, which is Portuguese and dies very young at the age uh, in 1923, I believe. And Sita then enters a monastery in Switzerland and becomes a nun. Her many children, the most famous one is the oldest, Otto of Habsburg, who becomes, um, first of all, in a fight with the Austrian government about um, the inheritance, what the Habsburg should get back from Austria. And secondly, he then becomes very active in the European Union, um, which was not that expensive as it's nowadays. But um, the inheritance issue with Austria and the return of the Habsburg that was settled in favor of the Republic. The third thing that I wanted to mention is, yes, Italy lost things, but Austria also lost something, a very important part, integral part, that Austria considered its own country, which is South Tyrol. And that was promised to the Italians in the Treaty of London. And that's one reason why Italy entered the war on the side of the Allies. So. We, Austria, fought that battle about South Tyrol till after World War II. I still remember growing up um, and uh, still getting the news that um, there were issues about the Brenner border and how much far south it should go. So those are just a couple comments on my part. Great. Thank you, Crystal. Very good. Anybody else? Mike, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation, and uh, it's just fascinating to hear about this aspect of World War One.